Hello, I'm going to talk to you today about language, gender and sexuality. There's many different aspects of this complicated topic, but I'd like to start with the question of being political. We often talk about being political, but it's quite an ambiguous term. And I follow uh, Ruth Vodak in defining this according to the distinction between capital P and small p politics. So when we talk about, for example, um, somebody saying, I don't like politics, uh, I don't like getting into politics, they might well be talking about things like governmental politics, so what the government's doing, and they might want to say, I don't feel part of that, I don't want anything to do, it, that, do with it. That's what we call capital P politics. But the argument of theorists working in, in linguistics and, and sociology or some of them at least, would be that it's also important to acknowledge small p politics, where everyday talk is charged with ideologies and opinions that are related to bigger questions that affect uh, groups of individuals and societies. So when we talk about small p politics in this way, we're defining, as I've done at the top of the slide here, any collective action for social justice, whether physical, virtual or theoretical, as political. So we're expanding the idea of politics here to something which is much bigger and much more common than government decisions. Um, furthermore, at the bottom of the slide here, political engagement is therefore the practices through which social actors publicly articulate and negotiate social relationships. So all of us all the time are involved in politics in some way through what we say and what we do, especially when that uh, pertains to our identities and the negotiation of who we are in in relation to the people around us. And one of the ways that this becomes very prominent in our lives is when we're talking about language, gender and sexuality. So one example of how we can draw linguistic ideas into the analysis of this kind of thing is to think about presupposition. So presupposition is a linguistic concept where we're talking about some kind of information being assumed or presupposed uh, in, in, in a particular sentence. So if we were to take this uh, sentence in red here, so have you women finished gossiping? We could say that underneath this statement, there are some assumptions which are being made, which are involved, uh, sort of hidden behind the grammar in a certain way. Uh, the presupposition, for example, that women's talk is trivial or that they usually engage in gossiping more than men do, or that two women who are talking together can be assumed to be gossiping. So by looking closely at language in this kind of way and talking in terms of the linguistic categories that we use in various fields of language study, we can trace the kind of ideological background which is uh, underneath all of the things which people say on a day-to-day -day level. And this is how uh, ideas are able to circulate, which are sometimes quite harmful to certain groups of people. One very clear example of this is sexism in popular culture. So the language of hip hop has been identified by Eggleston um, in terms of the sexist language and the frequency of the types of sexist language that are included in it. So this is just to point out that it's not always particularly subtle, uh, these kind of things like presupposition, for example. We can often see this kind of stuff very, very directly, uh, sexism uh, and also homophobia uh, in, in, in everyday life all around us, uh, for example, in, in hip hop. But it's not always so clear and so obvious for us to see. Language has an effect uh, in terms of uh, language, in terms of gender and sexuality, which may be more subtle, uh, may not be directly uh, homophobic or sexist, but there may be things which people say that are stigmatizing in a kind of um, underhand way that's not immediately visible. And this might happen in a school or the workplace or the family or any other group. So uh, the example on the slide here is uh, the phrase, that's so gay, which young people in playgrounds and classrooms, certainly in the UK and probably in many other places, use as a general term to say that's not good or I don't like it. So that's so gay can be a sort of general exclamation of negativity and very, very common. So the idea is that if somebody was to hear this kind of phrase every day for a long time, this would gradually build up 
uh, kind of accumulate to make them feel bad, uh, maybe victimized. And there's been studies which have pointed out that this kind of thing has a real important effect on people and sometimes causes things like uh, suicidal thinking, substance abuse, depression, etc. So what we're drawing attention to here is subtle uses of language, like the presuppositions in a way, um, that have a kind of cumulative effect over time on people. So there are many ways which language can hurt, uh, but they're not always directly observable as examples of uh, sexism, homophobia, racism, etc. Another interesting way that language studies have helped to paint a picture of this kind of process is by looking at the collocations that we find uh, with words. So just to define collocation quickly, uh, for those of you who might not know, what we're talking about is the company that a word tends to keep. So collocations set up expectations about certain words being followed by others. For example, in English, uh, we say heavy rain and we say strong wind. It doesn't work to say strong rain. Why not? Because it doesn't. That's the facts of the English language and it may well be different in, in, a, in, another, in another language. For example, if we were to say this uh, in, in Chinese, in Mandarin Chinese, we would say yu han da, feng han da. So uh, that would be a big rain, a uh, big wind. The point is certain languages set up expectations that certain terms will go with others. And this isn't just about grammar though. Uh, the second example here is the kind of collocation which we see around us quite a lot, but two, language, two, two words which tend to come together like greenhouse gas torrential rain. There's a kind of uh, an obviousness about their connection uh, because of the repeated use that we've seen uh, throughout our lives. So when we apply this to issues of sexism and homophobia, it's been observed that some words don't appear to be sexist in themselves, but when they're in a collocation, when they're with something else, um, that's when the negativity comes through. So there's been some very interesting studies, particularly in corpus analysis, where these kind of things have been investigated. Which words tend to come together and what kind of ideological effect does that have? So the examples here, the simple ones, working mother, career woman. Um, these are classic collocations. They seem to fit together. We, we, we see them together quite a lot, but they have implications about the way that we look at women. So some more extended examples of this come in Paul Baker's work on eligible bachelors and frustrated spinsters. So obviously bachelor is a word for an unmarried person which is generally used to refer to a male and a spinster is one uh, which is generally used to refer to an unmarried female and importantly they tend to have very different general connotations. Uh, bachelor being positive and spinster being negative which it may be argued shows something about the way that we think about um, unmarried women and unmarried men. And of course, this particular study that Baker's done is about establishing these ideas through looking at the words which tend to come next to uh, eligible or close, to, sorry, next to bachelor or spinster, or at least close to them in sentences. So if we take an example of a collocation list, which is the kind of um, result we can find from using corpus technology, we see that bachelor appears in a number of sentences. Obviously, Baker will have looked at a much uh, larger quantity than this. But we see if we look closely at the words which come one side or other of the bachelor, we might be able to spot some kind of pattern. And particularly, um, Baker selects eligible as the one that he highlights in his analysis because it kind of summarizes the, the positivity uh, that tends to come with words which uh, collocate with bachelor. And of course, the opposite uh, is found when we look at uh, spinster. Uh, lots more negative words coming beside this, even in this very short um, extract of data. Obviously, corpus analysis would look at a lot more and count uh, the kind of connotations which, which arise from certain words being next to others. There's lots of work being done like this. So uh, the, the, the link between gender and language becomes very clear when we look at it this way. Another a really interesting study by Baker uh, with Gavin Brooks is about lovely nurses, rude receptionists and patronizing doctors. So again, we're looking at words which tend to come together here 
um, which not only uh, represent uh, a common way of looking at these jobs, but also a common way of looking at gender because these jobs tend to be associated with a certain type of gender. So the overall point here, it doesn't have to be corpus linguistic analysis. But what we're trying to show is that by looking closely at the language people use, we can see the kind of ideologies which exist in a certain community. Here we've looked at uh, Britain and English for the kind of ideas which tend to circulate um, around us. But of course, we can apply it to any national context and any kind of identity. It doesn't have to be gender. <clears throat> so going back to the classic studies on language and gender, it's important to uh, show that these have been done and the important moves that they made in terms of the feminist struggle. So one classic study which is often talked about is Lakov's study from 1975. And she found that there were various categories that you could assign to women when they speak, such as using uh, tag questions like isn't she at the end of a sentence, or what she called empty adjectives like wonderful, lovely, charming, cute. So all of the things listed on the bullet points here are things which Lakoff said were more common in women's speech than in men's. And since then, this kind of thing has been challenged quite a lot because um, it, it does tend to paint a very black and white picture, uh, and possibly a stereotypical one. However, Lakov did have data to back this up. And importantly, this was part of a struggle to recognize uh, the dominance of men uh, in, in conversations perhaps, and, uh, and also to expose the ideologies underlying the way that people interact. So the way that men treat women, for example. Baxter in 2010 did something similar, but as you can see from the slide here, there were lots uh, more subtle categories um, that she claimed mapped onto the identity of female or woman. And for men also, uh, these kind of ways of talking, of doing things. So we're expanding a little bit here, but the same point coming through that we can classify uh, to a certain extent, the way that males and females talk, which of course is a very controversial point, especially when we take into account social constructionist ideas and postmodernist ideas, where we're thinking about identity as a little bit more complex than just male or female. For example, some of these things on here, being assertive, being aggressive, they may well reflect somebody's male identity, but they may also reflect other aspects of their identity, for example, being a father or, you know, being a, a, a university lecturer or even being in a certain situation or a certain place or interacting with a certain kind of person. So um, more modern studies would look at this kind of thing uh, in terms of the complexity of identities that's always involved in any kind of linguistic interaction. But that's not to say we should dismiss it entirely. There were some uh, convincing points made in this study and those before it uh, that there are things which men tend to do more than women. It's also important to bear in mind socialization in this kind of question because it's a fact that children tend to play and socialize in single sex social groupings. Um, obviously this isn't black and white either but there's a strong tendency here and there are different conversational goals which can be charted with that. There are different ways that boys tend to play, different ways that girls tend to play and the kind of um, social tasks that they carry out through language are typically different. And this reflects an ideology too. Women are expected to speak like a lady from an early age. And this involves being polite, being indirect, all of these uh, styles which correspond very much to the, to the studies we were seeing on, on the last few slides. So what we're talking about here is that because of this socialization process, not necessarily because somebody was born a woman, but as they grew up, there's this kind of um, repetition um, of these ideologies and these assumptions in society that push people to end up speaking in a way which which is like a woman. So it's a kind of cyclical process which you know, the cause and effect uh, are, are pretty mixed up here but the point is we do end up with less confident, uncertain, more powerless language um, which re reproduces the inferior status of women. So again we're going back to this feminist argument and the broader argument of uh, sociolinguistics 
in these in these current times to to challenge uh, through our analysis of language the uh, status quo in society, the way that things are taken for granted, and the kind of people who are uh, left behind or excluded as a result of these linguistic practices that reproduce um, deeper ideological divides. More recently then, um, we've moved away from the idea of essential characteristics like gender, uh, male versus female, and begun to bring in a little bit more subtlety and a little bit more um, nuance to our analysis. So we're not talking so much about women's and men's language in modern sociolinguistic, but we're talking more about how language is used to index various aspects of identity moment by moment. So these may well be gender uh, related, but there's also likely to be something to do with geography, socioeconomic group, ethnicity uh, and sexuality all coming in at the same time. So it's difficult, of course, to trace all of these things happening. And to some extent, we need solid categories to help us to categorize. And importantly, we need them to help us fight for marginalized groups. So there's always this playoff between acknowledging the complexity of identity work and using strong, stable categories to fight for people's rights. If we look at this in terms of uh, LGBTQ identities, in a similar way, we've moved away from uh, the initial stages of research quite a long time ago, back in the 70s and 80s, that was kind of looking for the ways that gays and lesbians speak and trying to sort of define a gay and lesbian language. But again, uh, we've moved uh, in modern times to more uh, subtle analysis of where, for example, men who identify as gay might involve in ways of speaking, in discourse which is non-normatively masculine in order to index uh, their sexuality. So this might be something phonological, such as using a, a high pitch, uh, a falsetto perhaps, like in the studies of Podesva, or it may well be something different, like using vocabulary, uh, something that reflects um, what we've seen in RuPaul's Drag Race, for example, using words like queen, um, or it could be something grammatical or, or something else. But the point is here, what we're looking at generally more often these days is the kind of specific linguistic signals which are used in one situation at one certain time for a certain identity effect. So a gay man may well, in some certain situations, use more of these signals to show uh, their, their, their sexual identity than they would in perhaps other situations. So this is the kind of subtlety that we're bringing in with more modern research on these topics. We're questioning categories and thinking more about how specific aspects of identity are performed in specific situations through the use of specific linguistic uh, features or words, etc. So this also involves a process of aligning or distancing, uh, and this applies much more broadly to processes of language and identity. We often use the way that we speak to show a sense of connection with the people around us or another group that we that we are uh, related to and we also use it to distance ourselves in some way so this is another way that we can look at identity uh, through the lens of language and broadly the way that the, the kind of changes that i've been talking about on the last couple of slides can be labeled in terms of queer linguistics so just to look at this uh, quote here, we're saying that queer linguistics cultivate a skepticism, a skepticism towards categories and more specifically identity categories. So um, we've seen with woman and man that these are problematic uh, categories that it's difficult to assume stability for. But as uh, Mochambasha carries on here, criticizing the way they may cause ignorance of intercategorical heterogeneity. So that means within the um, definition of woman we've got all different types of people all different types of situation and all different types of social goals um, there's lots that that doesn't just apply to woman of course it applies to gay and it applies to uh, lots of other identity categories um, also he goes on exclusion marginalization of less prototypical category members and a stigmatization of non-conforming practices so the point here is that we can use our analysis of the way people speak either about sexuality um, 
of their own or of others. And um, we can look at the way that this sometimes represents people being excluded or, or stigmatized if they are different from, from the main mainstream. So when we've got these solid ideas like woman, man, gay, straight, uh, the tendency is that they exclude certain people. The, the repetition and the use of the, the assumptions that we have every day about these categories tend to lead us to be blind to the diversity which exists amongst them. And of course, queer linguistics is a project which tries to uh, correct these imbalances in, in some way by exposing the ideology which is uh, underlying things which we say every day and trying to challenge uh, that ideology, whether it be from a feminist perspective or uh, from, from the perspective of LGBTQ rights. Um, we're trying to challenge categories and we're trying to challenge assumptions by looking at the language that people use every day. Some other uh, interesting examples of this kind of thing, now that we've moved on to this more subtle idea of uh, indexing identity rather than taking it for granted. There has been some interesting work done on lesbian identity, such as, for example, uh, Queen's work and Saunton and Morrish uh, talking about lesbians, people who identify as lesbians um, using in jokes, sort of saying things like, oh yes, we wear comfortable shoes or we have short haircuts and cats. So playing on stereotypes here, but applying them uh, to themselves and to the people around them for comic effect. And of course, this is one way of performing their identities and showing not only their connection with the people around them, but also their attitude to certain uh, ideologies which circulate in society. Similarly, uh, Lucy Jones's work deals with uh, the rejection of girly stereotypes and the embracing of dikey uh, stereotypes. But of course, this performance of lesbian identity that I've just been talking about, according to the kind of research which I've been talking about throughout this presentation, social constructionist, modern uh, contemporary research on language, gender and sexuality, we would see these uh, playing on lesbian stereotypes as a form of identity performance. So this goes back to the ideas of performativity from from Judith Butler. Classic examples of, uh, of this kind of uh, sociocultural uh, post-structuralist work on, on identity. And of course, Butler's key point was that gender is performative and performing it brings it into being. So really, as with queer linguistics, questioning these ideas of maleness, femaleness, gayness, straightness, etc. Um, and, and, and pointing to the fact that they emerge in, in situations, in conversations, and the fact that they're repeated again and again over time in, in, in a process which we, which, which we call intertextuality, the linking of something which has been said in the past with something which is being said in the present. These kind of processes lead to a kind of sedimentation whereby we get these seemingly concrete notions like woman and man. But of course, Butler and uh, all the researchers I've been talking about in, in the later part of this presentation would like to highlight how these processes are very much involved in power relationships. So the fact that we speak in certain ways and we show ourselves to be a certain person always involves drawing on categories which are uh, made for us by powerful structures uh, outside our control to some extent. Uh, but of course, we can navigate this on a day to day level as well. So possibly we might be resisting the idea of, of, of woman or of lesbian through the things that we say every day by pushing the boundaries of what people assume uh, on a on a general uh, general public level, let's say, uh, and pushing those boundaries by doing something different, by sort of talking in a way which rejects uh, the stereotypes, for example, or playing around with language in a way which pushes people to question uh, the assumptions which they make on a day-to-day -day level. So when we come at language, gender, and sexuality from this particular angle, uh, there's a lot of power here to, to make a difference. So if we round off here with uh, some quotes which relate to this uh, making a difference, Sunderland, uh, uh, one of the key 
researchers in the early 2000s on language and gender said that feminism recognizes the possibility of change and strives for it, including through explicit contestation of the existing social order through language. So really uh, driving home the point here, not just for feminism, but also for LGBTQ uh, campaigning and many other uh, stigmatized identities and stigmatized groups of people. We're saying that when we're doing this kind of linguistic research, we're trying to make change in society. We're trying to look at the existing social order. That's the way things are right now and challenging them through our analysis of language and through questioning the kind of things which people say. Deborah Cameron, Cameron another very key figure in, in language and sexuality, says language is not just about representing private mental states, it's also a public affirmation of values. So going back to that point that I made right at the start about big P and small P politics, Cameron is pointing out here that when we talk on a day to day level, it's not just representing uh, our thoughts. Uh, you know, it's something much more political than that. We're all engaging every day in stating our values, our morals, our ethical assumptions through the things that we say. And that sometimes is more subtle than giving a clear opinion. We might see it through presupposition, we might th see it through collocation or any of these other ways that language comes across every day. And finally, from uh, Mills, this third quote, anti-discriminatory interventions in language are forms of political action rather than trivial tinkering with language. So there is a kind of counter argument here that you might hear in the press or on an everyday level, sort of why do you have to worry so much about the language which people use on a day to day level? You know, that, that's just the way it is. Let it go. Why are you so serious? Why are you messing around with these categories? You know, for example, when we look at the uh, current debates around uh, transgender identity, which I would have liked to have talked about more today if I had time. Um, when we talk about the, the, the pronoun they, and we get this backlash from people saying, why are you messing around with language? You know, the person's either a he or a she. Why don't you just leave it? That's the kind of trivial tinkering idea that Mills is talking about here, which of course, uh, all of the researchers I'm, I'm quoting here and myself and anyone working in language, gender and sexuality is likely to say it definitely isn't trivial tinkering. These categories uh, and these uh, linguistic forms are extremely powerful in terms of uh, excluding certain types of people and disrespecting them, um, their, their fundamental right to define who they feel they are in their own terms.